He's got the clicker, and Michelle has got him back. Michelle is running in the back. I took that piece off of here. Do you want it up here? Because I need to set it down here. Inside. Good morning to everyone, and... Uh, First day of a brand new year, an exciting time for everyone. It's an exciting time for us as a congregation at Northwest in Greensboro, North Carolina. We welcome you and welcome those who are on Facebook. It's a time of challenge as well, and we have uh, certainly looked forward to this new year with its challenges, with its opportunities and uh, look forward to our worship time together. Jacques is going to lead us in some singing. David always has a very inspiring and challenging message as we look forward to that. I'd like to begin by reading God's Word in Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun, moon, and praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He has commanded, and they were created. An opportunity we certainly have today to praise our Heavenly Father and to enjoy our great fellowship that we have here at Northwest. Would you stand as Jacques leads us in our first song? The 
number 36, Amazing Grace. Father in heaven, we come before you at this time thanking you for all the marvelous gifts that you have given to us in this life and the marvelous gifts that are prepared for us after this life through God, thy son, Christ Jesus, who died upon the cross that we have that hope of eternal salvation when he took our sins away and bore them up on his own body. We ask, Father, that you be with each one of us as we go through this life and that we might remember that we have been bought with a price, the price of thy dear son. We ask, Father, that you be with the congregation here at Northwest as we begin a new year, and we ask that you bless every effort that is put forth to speak to those around this area that we might, they might see the good works coming from Northwest. Be with us as we have that theme of sowing and growing that we might be able to reach more people to get them to understand that Christ Jesus died for them and to understand that Without Christ, there is no hope in the life to come. We ask, Father, that you be with Brother David as he presents a portion of thy word to us today that give him a ready recollection of the things he has prepared. And may we listen with open hearts, not only open ears, but open hearts to receive the things from thy word and to apply them into our lives so that we, each and every day as we hear lessons from thy word and 
read thy Bible that we might be strengthened and grow stronger in the faith of Christ Jesus. We ask, Father, that you be with not only this congregation, but all those congregations throughout the world that are struggling to teach the truth. Be with Don and Kathy Iverson as they labor in India, and be with all those young congregations in India that they might continue to look to your, your word for guidance and instruction and continue to grow. We ask, Father, also that you be with our members that are traveling at this time, that they might have a safe return back to us. We also ask for the many that are on our prayer list that need your comfort and insurance, reassurance. We ask for Jackie Keene's mother, who is recovering from surgery, for Jacques Pettit's son, Jacques Pettit Jr., as he is in a, has a mental and physical health problems. We ask for Carmen's uh, mother, who has been hospitalized in New York for with lung issues, for Wanda Andrews' neighbor, who has cancer, and we ask also for Doug's father, who is battling a cancer also, and Angie's niece, niece's father who died, be with that family as a, the loss of a loved one, that they might feel your comfort around them. We also ask for Jock, mother Estelle, who returned from the hospital and awaiting tests, and we ask that you continue to be with her. And we ask that you be with Wilma Allen and her health issues that she is having. And also with John Ramson, who we know yesterday had to go to the emergency room with health issues again. Uh, we pray that you be with that family and encourage them and strengthen them and restore them all to health, if it be thy will, Father. We ask, Father, at this time that you go with us to the remainder of this service, but not only this service, but through all of our life, we need thee to guide us and direct us and till we either depart from this life or until Christ shall come. Be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You stand together with me and we'll sing 139, 139, far and near.
Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 9, 35-38, and this is coming from the New International Version. And the uh, scriptures are about the workers are few. I know we have a lot of uh, great workers here in Northwest and throughout all the congregations, and we just need to be praying that everybody works together for his, for his good and for his kingdom. <laughs> Starting in verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Well, I got up this morning, one of the first thoughts was, isn't retirement wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> then I got myself ready and went to work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to express my deepest thanks and appreciation to the church at Northwest and allowing me to have the opportunity for seven and a half years to serve as one of your ministers. And for many of those years to work alongside Rob, it's been uh, such a wonderful experience. And we're not going anywhere. So we want to still be here and work along with you. And in just a few days, Andrew Beasley will be moving down to join us. We want to support him. And... Um, dedicate ourselves to doing God's work here in Greensboro. We're also very thankful to have Larry and Karen Tanner with us this morning from uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Uh, they are also uh, Stephanie Ransom's um, uncle and aunt. So this is a small, small world that we have. I want to tell you... Uh, a little bit this morning about the my hometown where I grew up in central Illinois, Sullivan, and probably the most <coughs> noticeable thing about my hometown is the courthouse in the square. This is a drawing of the first courthouse in Moultrie County, Illinois. It was built in 1847. And in 1864, it was destroyed by fire. So they replaced it with the second courthouse. And uh, this is uh, the courthouse that was completed in 1866. And it served the country, uh, the county, until 1906 when they decided it was too small. So they tore it down and they built what's the third courthouse, the present courthouse there on the town square. Uh, my brother Charlie, I want to thank him because he did me a favor. He went up and took a picture of the cornerstone of the courthouse. And it has a personal effect to me because when the courthouse was constructed in 1906, on the cornerstone they dedicated it to the county um, supervisors and you probably I don't know if you probably can't make it out but Cicero Gilbreth was uh, my grandma Bragg's father, my great grandfather <clears throat> but I want to take us back to uh, 1939 it's 29 years before I was born but they had some great things going on in my hometown in 1939 during the Christmas season. They come up with this idea, wouldn't it be great to reward the people of our town and those who come downtown to do their shopping if we threw off 
of the top floor of the courthouse some live birds. So they had a write-up even in the paper. <laughs> They'll fly through the air with the greatest of ease, ducks, guineas, and turkeys, and great big fat geese. So beginning a few um, days before Christmas, they came together, and at 2 o'clock on the after afternoon of December 16th, they started throwing off poultry, live birds off the top floor of the courthouse. They said, we're not going to make it known uh, when certain kind of birds are going to be thrown. But then I, this was posted on Facebook. Somebody remembered this. And then I started seeing all these comments of people. But I remember when they did this, and my mom and dad were eating downtown during their lunch break, and all these birds came flying out. So that's what they thought they should try. When we talk about, as Jules began us this morning in our Bible class, about the Great Commission, God is not asking us to come off with some flashy scheme to try to draw people in. Um, there have been many efforts to do that. There are churches who have held special raffles, giveaways, drawings for money. There are there was a church a few years ago who had a special event where you could come and wrestle with one of the preachers. <laughs> there are many churches who have decided to add rock bands in an effort to draw in people. But we have to keep in mind that Christianity is a taught religion. Yes. And it's based upon a willingness of God's people to teach the gospel to carry out the Great Commission. The gospel, if you will, is the curriculum of the church. And the beautiful thing about the Great Commission is that every Christian has obeyed the gospel. So if you think about it, every Christian, from the time that they are brought up out of the water, through the, just their experience, know enough about the gospel to teach the gospel, because the gospel is so simple. Luke 19 and verse 10, Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. In Luke 9 and verse 23, Jesus said, If you will come after me, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And in Mark 16, verses 15 through 16, to me, one of the clearest statements that we can ever find, Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. Baptism is the washing away of our sins. It's being buried with Christ and being united with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. The ultimate fellowship that we can have is teaching others about Christ. Because yeah. when you think about it, when we teach someone about Jesus, we have this special fellowship with Christ in sharing that. But when we help someone to understand the implications of that, we develop the greatest fellowship with the person that we're teaching. So we've spent... A, entire year 2022 and we focused on Sunday morning on the idea of fellowship the ultimate fellowship that we can have with God with each other as we encourage and support one another and with those that we are endeavoring to teach all revolve around the gospel of Jesus Christ now, I want to look at this passage this morning in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 9 and think about it from the perspective of that familiar parable, the parable of the sower. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, 
Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages. Now, my focus in this section is on Jesus and reflecting on who he is. Jesus was an eternal resident of heaven before he decided, or God decided, he agreed to leave behind his deity, to leave behind the restraints or the, the, the unrestrained power of his eternal person and to be born into the human race, to grow up, to serve, to teach about God, and then to die on the cross. And Jesus willingly agreed to do all of that. He willingly agreed to teach these disciples about who he was and who God was. And here in our text, preparing to send them out on what's generally referred to as the limited commission, because there were limits, go to the Jewish people. They weren't concerned about the Gentiles. So it was a limited scope of their commission. Every Sunday, when we gather together to partake of the Lord's Supper, we are bringing to mind the cost Jesus paid for our salvation. So I think about all the things that Jesus went through, all that he suffered, all that he denied himself, to now be seated at the right hand of God, to once again to share that eternal characteristics of God that he gave up to become a man. And I started looking at all the verses that we have in the New Testament that talk about Jesus being seated or standing at the right hand of God. There, there are too many for me to think about, to relate to you this morning. But over and over again, especially in the book of Hebrews, we're reminded of where Jesus is right now. And he's there because of his willingness to come to be with us, to walk as a human. And then to allow himself because he himself said he could call angels to rescue him, to allow himself to be crucified so that we can have a atoning sacrifice for our sins. Yes. If that's not good news, then I don't know what is. And so we are given the gospel. The Savior is ready. He's done his part. He's served his role, and he serves us still there at the right hand of God for our benefit, for our encouragement, for our strength. That's what Jesus has done for us. The Savior is ready. The last half of that verse, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Jesus told a lot of parables that are agriculturally based. And in those parables, a lot of times he talks about the seed. My favorite reference, though, is in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11, where Jesus is explaining the parable of the sower, and he says, the seed is the word of God. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Peter reminds us in this letter that the power of Scripture is that God used holy men being moved by his Holy Spirit to write down this word. And today, in 2023, we can carry it with us. In fact, I would hazard to guess that a lot of you have it with you right now and rarely leaves your person. Mm. We carry it along yeah. with us. Yes. 
we have so many tools and so many advantages of technology that's available to us today to teach this word. Yes. But when we think about it, the word of God has done its job. Yes. Those men that were moved by the Holy Spirit that wrote down these scriptures that we carry with us today, many of them we know them by heart. They're readily accessible to us. There's no more inspired revelations to be given. There are no more inspired men to write down additional books of the Bible. There are no more sermons on the mount to be preached. There are no more miraculous healings to be performed by our Lord. The word of God is perfect and complete. And everything that we need to know to get to heaven is contained in this word. And there can be different translations, and there will be different translations as time goes on. But the content, the message, will never change. Not only is the Savior ready, but the seed is ready. And we have it within easy grasp of our fingers. In verse 36, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Jesus was always concerned about others. He was always concerned about those who were living around him, who his life would intersect with. And I think about that parable of the sower. It's one of the few parables that's recorded in each of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All of those inspired writers told us about this parable that Jesus delivered to the people. That signifies to me that it's important. But when Jesus told this parable, he was not concerned about agricultural economics. He wasn't concerned about the percentage of yield that a farmer might have. He wasn't concerned about profit margins or market prices. He was concerned about the multitudes. Yes. He was concerned about those that were lost, who were like sheep, having no shepherd. So on a different occasion, Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd. There are people all around us every day who are shepherdless, who need a shepherd, who need a savior, who need to understand the word. Jesus was concerned about hearts. And so we've all been familiar with and we've heard lessons on how each of these Soils in which the seed found itself, the rocky, the thorny. They represent human hearts. That's what Jesus was concerned about. Jesus was concerned about the hearts of those around him. About those whose heart had been blinded by Satan. About those whose hearts are entangled with the choking vines of worldliness about those who are intimidated by opposition that Christians often face, about those who are deceived by empty promises of religious leaders. That's what Jesus was concerned about. Yeah. He was concerned about the people. Not only is the Savior ready and the seed is ready, but the soil is ready as well. Look around. 
in November of 2020, the Rockdale County, Georgia Sheriff's Office placed a notice, a post on their Facebook page requesting area citizens for their help in apprehending the 10 most wanted criminals in his county. And he put the pictures up there. Well, it wasn't but just a few days before one individual by the name of Christopher Spaulding responded to the Facebook page and said, what about me? <laughs> so they went back and started going through their different, and sure enough, he had two warrants for arrest. And so they replied to his reply and posted, we're on our way. <laughs> and within a day or two, he found himself behind bars. When we hear the Great Commission, and as we're studying on Sunday morning in our Bible class, and as we will hear throughout the year, our response ought to be, what about me? Because Jesus is relying upon us to share the news. So not only is the Savior ready, and the seed is ready, and the soil is ready, what about the sowers? Yes. In verse 37, Jesus said, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus was relying upon God to help him prepare laborers to go out into the harvest. The beautiful thing about Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, is that it is immediately followed by chapter 10 and verse 1. And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and diseases. And then he lists the names of them. In verse, chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, he said, pray to send forth laborers. And then in chapter 10 and verse 1, he said, here they are. They were the answer to Jesus' prayer. They were the answer. They were the key to his prayer. And so are we. God's plan depends upon us. You think about the conversion of Cornelius. You remember the angel that appeared to Cornelius and said, send to Joppa and ask for Peter? Yes. And you remember the vision that Peter had there of the sheet that was coming down? And then finally got uh, the Lord telling him not to look upon those as unclean. And how he came to understand when he entered the household of Cornelius that it was his responsibility to teach the gospel. Yes. The angel didn't do it. The vision didn't do it. The man did it. Mm. Or Philip and the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. How the angel in verse 26 spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And now the angel 
told him when he saw the chariot, go and join this chariot. Now the angel could have much more easily stopped that eunuch and told him about Jesus. But that's not the angel's job. That's not the angel's responsibility. The man did it. God has a plan. Yes. And that, imp that plan involves us. Yes. So the Savior is ready. <clears throat> the seed is ready. The soil is ready. How about us? Can we look at ourselves as sowers? Washington Post reported last November about an unusual case that took place in Germany where an elderly woman was placed in the hospital in Mannheim, Germany with a roommate who was on life support. And this 72-year-old woman was caught by the staff turning off her roommate's ventilator. They asked the woman, why did you do this? And she said, well, the noise was annoying me. And they said, you can't do that. This woman needs this machine to live. It wasn't just a couple of days later, they found the same woman turning off the same ventilator. She was warned about the importance of it. She went ahead and did it anyway. And so they moved her from the hospital to the jail. And they charged her with attempted manslaughter. So this is what I, I want to share with you this morning that I think is so important for us to keep in our minds. The world around us is on life support. The world around us needs to hear a cure. And you and I have that cure. And we know it works. Because we've done it ourselves. And so all the Lord is asking us is that we share that good news with those who are lost. And so we need to make a plan. And we need to rely upon each other to carry that plan out. And we need to trust... <coughs> in God to allow that plan to bear fruit. There are two things that are musts when it comes to the gospel. The first thing is that we must obey it. And on at least two occasions in the New Testament, Inspired writers talked about how God desires all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. And Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but he's long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. So this Lord and Savior who is at the right hand of God this morning, having secured the perfect sacrifice for sins, wants the world to know that good news. And here in this community, that responsibility falls to you and I. And so as we go through this 
year. And as we have this new beginning, these new opportunities that have never before been presented to this congregation, Jesus is still praying, Lord, send forth reapers. He's praying for us. The second thing that's a must when it comes to the gospel, we must obey it, but we must also share it. But we're never alone. You remember how the Great Commission ends in Matthew? And lo, I am with you always. Let's take the Lord, let's take his message. Let's share it with those who are lost. And by working with him and working with one another and working with those who are lost in the world, we can experience the ultimate fellowship that's available for us. This morning, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, or anytime if you're watching online, use the opportunity that's before you now to make a commitment to obey the gospel and to share the gospel. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, then please come and let us know as we stand and sing. and minds for the Lord's Supper will be singing 359, 359, <laughs> Jesus keep me near the cross.
Good morning. Does everyone have what they need for the communion? I want to prepare ourselves for the taking of the Lord's Supper by reading from first, uh, excuse me, from Ephesians chapter one, beginning in verse three. It says, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world." that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us, for, uh, predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. Now, I, I share this passage um, because in about two weeks at Carolina Bible Camp, we will have uh, winter camp. And it's a time, long weekend, short period of time for our teens to come and be together again in fellowship. And, you know, uh, in between that long period of time between summers. The theme for this year is blessings. And the passages are from, well, this chapter in First Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1 that speaks to, as it says, blessed who has blessed us with every blessing. And so I connect that to our the Lord's Supper this morning because we partake of the bread and we partake of the fruit of the vine and it's an act of worship to remind us of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I would offer, it should also remind us of, as it says here in verse 7, that the blessing that this represents, that we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. The greatest blessing we have. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you so much as we take this time to think about not only the opportunities we have in front of us, but we know that you have equipped us with so many blessings. You've given us the things in this life that we need to not only survive, but to succeed. We have more than enough health and wealth and technology and opportunity to do all the things that not only we need to do, but all the things we can and want to do. And as important as all those things are, Father, help us to remember that the most important blessing we have from you is to be called pure and holy, having our sins forgiven, an entrance way into heaven, we know that heaven is perfect and no imperfect thing can enter into it. And so as we reflect on this time, this communion, we take of this bread, Father, it represents that body of Jesus that went to the cross. And as your word tells us, all of the sins of the world, he put into his body and nailed them to the cross, putting them to death. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you would be willing to send your son to do that. Thank you for the blessings we receive in return for that. We just pray that as we partake of this bread, it becomes an immediate reminder of the sin that we have and the need for that sacrifice. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Again, it says, in him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. As we partake of the fruit of the vine, let's reflect on that richness of his grace. Will you pray with me? 
Father, we're so thankful that on the first day of every week when we come together and worship, you have given us a, an instruction, an example, a reminder, a memorial, a remembrance that our sins have been forgiven because of the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ. We know that there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. What only a perfect sacrifice could do, you sent your son. Father, we know that we sin. We know we need forgiveness. We know we need our sins wiped away. We just pray as we take this fruit of the vine that it becomes for us that exact remembrance we need to be thankful and grateful for the work that you've done for us. In Jesus' name. We also have at this time the opportunity to give back a portion of, of these blessings that we have physically. We have offering plates at the uh, foyer on the back table. If you've not had an opportunity to do so, you can do so before you leave out today. We pray for uh, the blessing we have. Father, we also take this opportunity to approach you once more and Having just been reminded of the spiritual blessings we have, um, we look also to the physical blessings we have and our ability to share those and to join those funds together to the work of the church. Father, we're thankful that we know as we think about evangelism, we know that we can do so much more together than we can do individually. And we look upon these funds, Father, and know the same thing, that what we collect together can do so much more than what we have individually. So we just pray that we would use them wisely, use them to growing your kingdom, to making disciples, and doing all the things necessary, Father, to show compassion and, and to help show benevolence to those who are in need as well. Thank you again for the blessings we have in this life. We pray blessing upon the contribution in Jesus' name. After this closing song, we'll have our closing prayer, and then after that, we will have our announcements. Please remain seated for the announcements. Now, as we uh, sing the first verse of this song, let us think about our responsibility as we enter this land uh, to bring the gospel to the world. And remember that the battle does belong to the Lord. We have him on our side. Just stand together with me as we sing this song. Yeah, man. in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you this day thanking you for this new day, this new year you've blessed us with. We thank of those that are on our prayer list this day. Pray that you be with each individual, each need. Pray that you give them strength, give them encouragement, that you watch over them and guide them. We thank you for the men in our church that take the time each week to prepare a lesson and share with us each week, for David, for Rob, for Jules. And we ask you to be with us as we begin this new year. 
Help us in staying close to thee. We thank you for the good shepherd, your son Jesus, who was willing to die upon the cross for our sins. And help us in staying close to thee by praying with thee daily, reading your word daily, and sharing the good news of the good shepherd with those we come into contact with. It's your name we pray. Amen.